Okay, we're just waiting for our technology. Um, just for those people who just arrived, we were just going over the ins and outs of the YouTube site. You can get to our YouTube site by going to youtube.com slash SETI Institute or Google SETI Institute Talks or uh, anything like that. Uh, view the intro video and um, pass on the links that I send in the emails uh, around to your friends. All right. Okay. Volume on. Audio on. Yeah. Just hang there for a second. Are we ready to go, Lee? Just checking that our connection is okay. Because our resolution is so high, we need most of the bandwidth of the SETI Institute, so we're actually relying on most of the PIs and scientists to be down here and not watching YouTube videos <laughs> upstairs. So we, it goes up and down. Okay, we're on. Okay, so welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your weekly SETI seminar series. Today we're very lucky to be joined by Olivier Guyon, who's uh, come across to us from the Subaru Telescope and uh, the University of Arizona. Uh, Olivier uh, did his uh, PhD at the University of Paris and University of Hawaii, uh, and the, his topic was uh, wide field interferometric interfer imaging and applications. Uh, his supervisors were Pierre Lina and uh, Francois Rodier. Uh, and, uh, uh, he graduated in 2002 and uh, then did a, a postdoc at uh, University of Hawaii. And <coughs> in 2008, he was appointed an, a prof an assistant professor at the University of Arizona. Uh, and then in 2009, he uh, took over a project called Extreme AO uh, at the Subaru Telescope. In, uh, in he is the recipient of several awards, including the Daniel uh, Gunier Award, which is a French uh, young physicist uh, award. And uh, he was a, a recipient in 2006 of the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers in, in the United States. Uh, and then uh, last year, he was the recipient of a MacArthur Award um, for his work, uh, particularly uh, on uh, adaptive optics and methods of uh, characterizing exoplanets, as we're going to hear in his talk. Uh, he is uh, interested in coronarography, wavelength sensing techniques for adaptive optics and astro astrometry. Uh, and he developed uh, the phase-induced amplitude apodization technique, PIAA uh, coronagraph, um, that we're going to hear a lot about today, I'm sure. So please join me in welcoming, welcoming Olivier. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me and giving me this opportunity to talk about uh, what I think is an extremely exciting topic. Um, it, it's, it's basically the, the, the we are living at a time when we can see ways in the near future uh, that that we will be able to take uh, direct images of, of habitable planets and study them in, in enough detail to actually start uh, answering these very uh, old questions: Are we alone? Um, so this is this is what I'm going to talk uh, to you about today. Um, I'll I'll start with a short introduction about direct imaging. There are many ways to detect planets. Uh, direct imaging is um, one of the most challenging ways, uh, but it's very important scientifically, and I'll, I'll describe why it is important, but also why it is challenging. Um, that will then lead us to uh, talk a little bit about technology to, to overcome this challenge. Um, and, and then I will describe scientific opportunities that uh, are really right around the corner uh, for both space and, and ground-based uh, uh, observatories. And then I will finish with something quite different, uh, which is a project um, that a few of us are, are starting to uh, engage the public, especially schools and, and citizen scientists, into discovering uh, exoplanets with the transit method. So the, the planets that are the most interesting to image are the ones that are habitable, the ones that may uh, sustain life uh, as we know it, or, or nearly so. Um, and our job uh, is made easy, at least in, in knowing exactly where to look. Every star in the sky um, has what we call a habitable zone. This is the zone <coughs> around the star uh, within which if you place a planet similar to the Earth, uh, it's uh, 
temperature will be uh, such that there will be liquid water and there could be life as we know it. Um, and the habitable zone uh, is, is ranging from being very close to stars for uh, dwarf stars, M-type stars, low luminosity stars, to being quite far out for very bright stars. And this is a concept that, that we always have to keep in mind when we're looking for a habitable planet because we have to, to think about exactly <laughs> where we want to look around which stars. Uh, that drives a lot of the instrument uh, capabilities and requirements that, that we need to keep in mind. So we live in a very exciting time because we are now identifying planets of size and mass similar to the Earth. So we know for sure now that uh, the Earth is not unique as a, as a Earth-sized planet. Um, this is a, a, a graph here that shows uh, on, on the horizontal axis the year of discovery and on the vertical axis the planet mass. And there are two lines. There's a Jupiter mass line, which is where we got started uh, in the mid-90s when we started discovering uh, planets, mostly with the radial velocity technique. And then in the bottom, uh, there is a, a suitably chosen green color for our earth size earth mass planets and uh, we're starting to see dots appearing uh, around that line so we are now uh, seeing the tip of the iceberg of, of, of probably a large number of such planets um, unfortunately we still know very little about what goes on on those planets because um, uh, they are the, 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 the low mass planets the ones that are around the earth mass uh, uh, line are detected using indirect detection techniques. We don't actually, uh, we are not able to measure the light that comes, that is reflected or emitted by the planet itself. Uh, we see it's there uh, because it's uh, moving the star around which it orbits or because it's hiding some of its light as it transits in front of it. So the next uh, step to gain knowledge about what goes on on those planets is, 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 is going to be direct imaging. It's going to be uh, analyze the light uh, that is emitted or reflected by this planet to study chemical composition. Uh, is there uh, oceans, clouds, polar caps, and so on. Uh, this is an example of what we might be able to do if we manage to actually de de detect such light. Uh, a very convenient way we can take a spectra of the Earth is, is to look at Earth shine. So we look at uh, a thin crescent of the moon, but instead of looking at the bright side, the side that's illuminated directly by the sun, we look at this uh, uh, not so bright side the earth shine which is actually light that is uh, emitted re uh, reflected by the earth and shines onto the the so-called dark side of the moon uh, and then we can take a spectra of this and and we we have an idea of what we may be able to do if we took a spectra of an exoplanet looking at earth as uh, uh, as a planet as a whole um, and and you can see in the spectra in the right here which which covers uh, the red part of the of the visible spectra that we can see uh, a, a very interesting molecules and evidence of life. We can see that there's oxygen on Earth. We can see the Earth as an atmosphere. The sky is blue, uh, the, the Rayleigh scattering in the blue ramping up. Um, we can uh, even see the, the so-called vegetation jump or red edge. We can detect that there's vegetation on Earth uh, with the, a sharp increase in reflectivity as we move uh, from uh, the red to the, to the near infrared. Um, so this is exactly what we would like to do for, for exoplanets, for other planets, particularly the ones that are in habitable zones of, of nearby stars. So why is it difficult? Why haven't we done it already? So the, one of the closest things uh, uh, we can find as, as an, an image of an of a Earth-like planet around a Sun-like star is this image. This is, a, this is a very big coronagraph. This is Saturn. And it's, uh, it's taken by the, this image is taken by the Cassini spacecraft as it is in the shadow of Saturn. So it is looking back. Uh, at Saturn. The Sun is behind the planet and we can actually see Earth in this picture. Uh, so <laughs> we're here. <laughs> so now imagine that we remove Saturn and we make all of this much further away, much fainter, much smaller also angularly. This is the job uh, that we have to do. This is, this is um, uh, why it is challenging. And just in case you, you didn't see it in the wide field image, here is Earth uh, pretty much uh, just uh, near the center of this frame here. On the, um, on, on the really zoomed image, you can actually see the moon around the Earth. So every single one of us is on this picture, uh, 10 to the minus something big of a pixel large. <laughs> um, okay, so let's move to technology. Now I think, I think we have convinced you that it, it's, it's, 
it's not straightforward. It's, it's a little bit challenging. So we need to think about how, how we do this. Um, we need a, a, a chronograph. So I, I, I sp I've spent most of my career uh, uh, working with, with other scientists and engineers designing chronographs. This is the simplest one I ever built. Uh, <laughs> this is my thumb in front of the sun. Uh, and and it, it works. It's very simple, very reliable, uh, easy to deploy. Uh, but it, I don't think I need to tell you uh, uh, in great detail why it doesn't work well enough to detect exoplanets around other stars. Uh, there are two problems. Um, we need a, a, a better chronograph, something better than my thumb, and we need a larger eye, a large telescope. Um, so just expanding the size of this thumb in front of an eye actually doesn't work uh, because of, of, of the very nature of light. And this is an old uh, challenge, an old problem that, that, uh, that uh, uh, was discovered uh, in, in the 19th century, in the early 19th century. So, in, in uh, 1807, uh, Thomas Young publishes his, his famous double slit experiment result. He, he basically showed uh, that um, shining light through two slits and looking at the screen behind, he, he saw fringes, uh, which clearly cannot be explained if you consider that light is particles uh, going through the, the slits. Uh, the, so the, the, the French were very puzzled by this. Uh, and um, in, in 1818, the French Academy decided to launch a, a committee to actually uh, to, to try to explain the nature of light. Um, because there's, now there's this, these competing theories. There's the, the corpuscular theory of light, which, uh, um, which was the, the, the standing theory up, up to, this, uh, this, to this experiment. And this experiment showed that, that there was something wrong with that theory. Uh, Fresnel submitted his wave uh, theory of light, explaining, <coughs> explaining in, in, in mathematical and physical terms what Thomas Jung observed. Um, and and uh, Poisson, who was another member of this uh, competition, uh, looks at this theory and he clearly finds uh, a flow. He, he, he takes Fresnel's equation and he, he computes that according to those equations, if you shine light uh, into, um, uh, if, you, if you have a, a beam of light and you put a, a circular mask in that beam, behind that circular mask, exactly along the line of sight, there will be a bright spot for me. Uh, as if light found a way to go get around and build a bright spot. His conclusion was that that clearly proved that Fresnel's equations were wrong uh, and, and, and that his, his explanation of, of the theory of, of, the, of the nature of light was wrong. Arago, who was chairing the committee, was very puzzled by this. Uh, so he actually uh, performed the experiment. And he found the spot that Fresnel predicted. Uh, so this is why you will hear that spot as the poison spot or as the Arago spot. <laughs> Um, and when we design chronographs, all of our problems and challenges really come from this uh, nature of light, the, the wave nature of light. This is why just making my thumb bigger and using a bigger eye um, is not going to work. And there's a, now that we've, we know that light is, is made out of wave, there's an analogy we can, we can look at. Um, here I show on the left a, a, a picture taken from a plane of waves being diffracted by an island. Um, so if waves were particle, you could position yourself behind this island uh, on a boat, and the water would be perfectly still. Uh, but because waves are waves, they actually uh, diffract, they interact with the borders of the island. And you, as you can see in this picture, um, they, they, uh, they create secondary waves that emanate from, uh, from this shore that diffract in all directions. Light behaves exactly the same way. Uh, this is why just putting a bigger thumb and standing behind it is not going to work because of the Arago poison spot and because of um, uh, this, this wave nature of light uh, that's visualized by this, uh, this image of, of the ocean coast. Um, when we look at it with a telescope, it materializes itself as airy rings. So if you take an image of a star, or a, or a point source at infinity, even with a perfect telescope in the absence of atmosphere, what we see is the image on the right, which has those bright rings. When I say bright, I mean in the context of finding exoplanets. They're actually not that bright. Usually, most astronomers don't care about those rings. They're very happy to see them, because that means the image is very good. Uh, but for us, uh, they're too bright uh, to see planets. And if we look uh, at, at how bright those rings are um, in linear scale, uh, here on the top right, that doesn't look too bad. 
the, the first ring is at a um, couple of percent of the intensity of, of the peak. But if we look at them in, in logarithmic scale, here in, a, in the bottom right drawing, and we place where a nerve, uh, as seen by a two meter telescope at a distance of 30 light years would be in reflected light, we can see that there are a huge problem. There are several orders of magnitude between the brightness of those rings and where the planet is located. So we need to find a way to overcome this diffraction, to build an optical system, which is not just a normal telescope. Uh, it will be something that doesn't have those rings. So just uh, to, to go back to the analogy of the shore uh, diffracting the, the, the ocean waves, you could actually design an island which would have the exact uh, uh, shape and, and contours, shore contours, so that in some direction the diffraction cancels. There's no wave that's diffracted out. And we can do that optically too. This is a, a, a concept that, that's, that's been developed starting from the 60s, uh, the 60s and, and, and then more recently optimized for exoplanet detection, since the diffraction actually comes from the edges of the telescope beam, just like it, in the ocean it comes from the edges of the shore, you could try to optimize the shape of the telescope so that you don't have such diffraction. Um, and you cannot do that for all directions simultaneously, but you can do that for some directions. Um, and, and here I extracted a, a figure from a, a recent paper that shows a particular design uh, if you put this uh, mask in the, in the top figure in front of your telescope and you take an image, the image you will have uh, shown in the, in the bottom here is very dark in some direction. And you could look for a planet in this direction. Uh, you could also make this, so this is called apodization, uh, and, and this particular example shows um, a binary way of doing it. We put a mask, light either goes through or is blocked, but you could also do it smoothly. So you could actually remove the edges from the beam altogether you could gradually have uh, the beam bright at the center and, and, and gradually getting fainter toward the edge with no discontinuity, and then you would not have uh, those, those rings, those, this diffraction. So this is a family of technique that's very useful, either used by itself or in combination with, with other uh, opt optical techniques uh, to, to achieve the high contrast we need uh, to see planet. Uh, so I've been working for, uh, for quite a few years now with, with other scientists and engineers. On, on a way to do this very efficiently. So unlike the previous slide, which requires you to remove actually most of the light that your telescope would otherwise gather, uh, the technique that is shown here, uh, which is called phase-induced amplitude apodization, uh, is very efficient because we, uh, we remap the beam. So we start with the telescope beam. It's not what we want. It has sharp edges. We would like something that does not have sharp edges. Instead of removing light from the edge to make it uh, smooth, we actually redistribute light using aspheric optics. Um, and in this, in this cartoon, this is shown as two mirrors. Uh, essentially, what we're doing is we're taking light and, and, and compressing it towards the center of the beam. And when you get toward the edge of the beam, we stretch it out. So we get what comes out of the system is something that doesn't have sharp edges. Therefore, there will be no diffraction rings coming from it. Uh, but we've managed to do this without losing any light. So we preserve the sensitivity and the angular resolution of the telescope. Um, and we've built several <coughs> uh, experiments based on this concept using either mirrors, as shown in the top, or our lenses here at the, at the bottom right. Um, uh, one of these experiments is at uh, Jet, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in, in a large vacuum tank. Uh, in the top picture, this is the vacuum tank in the, in the back. Uh, it's actually large enough so that you can enter the vacuum tank and, and stand in it uh, when it's not vacuum. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> and if you open the vacuum tank and look inside it, you see an optical bench with a, a, a chronograph system. This is basically a prototype for something we would like to launch, uh, for an instrument we would like to launch on a spacecraft, which would take the light from the telescope, process it in a way that, that the diffraction rings do, don't exist and we can look for planets. Um, those are uh, recent results we obtained in the testbed. Uh, without going too much into the technical detail, if you look at the, at the image uh, here uh, on the left, you can see a, a green box and within it a white box. The white box is where we optimize the system to not have any light from the star. Um, and it's actually an image, so there's no planet in this image because we're in the lab and, and all we're looking at is the head of an optical fiber which simulates the star. But if this were on a spacecraft looking at a star and there was an Earth uh, around that star, you would see it 
in that image. Uh, it would just uh, pick up the contrast in this image is, 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 is better than, a, uh, is better than a, a, a billion to one. That means we've made this area right next to the star fainter than a billion times fainter than the star. And that's just good enough so that we would see a, a nerf flag planet pop up right in there. Uh, closer to here, there is a, an, an experiment using the same concept at uh, NASA Ames. This is led by uh, uh, Russ Bedikoff's team. Um, and, and, and this is actually getting close, uh, closer to, a, to an actual space mission because this is prototyping an instrument uh, for a, a mission which is called Exceed, uh, which we're uh, hoping uh, uh, NASA will, will select and launch in the near future. And this is a, a short description, description of Exceed. Uh, it's, uh, it's a fairly small telescope. It's uh, 0 0.7 meter uh, in diameter. But what's amazing is that by using an optimal technique, an optimal chronograph technique with such a small telescope, we're, we're doing uh, considerably better, orders of magnitude better than what a larger telescope, normal telescope could do for this particular uh, science case. So for example, uh, this, this small telescope would be much more powerful than Hubble uh, for detecting disks and planets around uh, nearby stars, just because it has been optimized for that purpose. So now let's talk a little bit about scientific opportunities. This, so w what is this technology uh, going to enable uh, in the near future? There, it's, it's interesting to imagine, and I, I really love dreaming about such a world, a world where every star in the sky has an Earth twin, a habitable planet, that is located in the middle of its habitable zone. So it's basically um, uh, sort of gives us a target list of, of w what we need to be able to, to see. And here I've taken all the stars within 20 parsecs, about 60 light years. And around every single one of them, I've placed a planet like the Earth. And I've placed the planet exactly at the right distance from the star so that it has the same temperature, the same flux input from, from its star as we experience on Earth from the Sun. Um, there's a lot of information on this. Um, uh, I'll, I'll describe it a little bit. Uh, in more detail, the, the horizontal axis is the angular separation in hexagon. So that's how far in angle in the sky the planet and the stars are separated by. Um, the uh, one hexagon is, is, is on the right, uh, and, and on the towards the left, it's about 10 million hexagon, which is the diffraction limit of, of a large ground based telescope in the visible. Um, the vertical axis is the contrast. At the top is a million to one. And at the bottom is, uh, is, 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 is uh, actually a, a, a thousand billion to one. So as you move towards the bottom, things get harder. But as you move towards the right, uh, things get easier because you increase the separation. And we have this painful trade-off between contrast and separation. So if we pick, uh, um, if, if we're not able to see very close to the star, we actually have to uh, be able to go very deep in contrast. And that's due to the fact that as you move a planet outward from the star, the angular separation increases, but the contrast becomes more challenging. You get less reflected light bouncing off. Um, and, and, and the last element here is, is why is it that there is such a range is due to the fact that not all stars have the same brightness. So the red stars, the red circles, are actually cool stars. They're faint stars. And around those stars, the habitable zone is very close. Uh, so if you, ha if you need to maintain life as we know it, you need to put the planet actually very close to the star, which is why they're clustered towards the left side of the graph. But the contrast is not that challenging because the planet is actually sitting pretty close to its star. So it catches a, a larger fraction of the total light emitted by the star. If we think about a, s a solar type star, uh, roughly in the middle of this graph, we have to be able to get to um, between a billion to one and 10 billion to one contrast at an angular separation of about a tenth of an hexagon to start to be able to see a few uh, planets like the Earth. Uh, if we think about a brighter star, we're moving to the bottom right corner of this graph. Uh, there is uh, fewer of them, because most stars are actually fainter than the Sun. So we see that the, the graph is getting sparser. Uh, and the, the angular separation becomes more favorable, because the habitable zone is the planet has to be quite far away from its star to be at a comfortable, not too warm uh, location. But the contrast is very challenging. So when we think about instruments, we, we have to keep this trade-off in mind and look at where, uh, uh, where is the optimal spot for a given uh, telescope. In space, the optimal spot is right around the center. So it's actually for stars that are not too different from the sun. Um, 
and, and with a 2 to 4 meter uh, diameter space telescope in a visible light, we would be able, uh, with the techniques I, I just introduced, we would be able to actually uh, see a few, to see Earth-like planets uh, if they exist around a few stars that are sun-like. Um, here's an example of a, of a mission, that, that concept that we've been working on. So uh, here we have a, uh, this is for a 2.4 meter telescope. This is about the entry level size you want to have, the diameter of the telescope. This is Hubble size. Uh, and and it's, it's at that diameter that you would start to be able to see a few habitable planets uh, with the techniques I presented. Uh, and, and here is the same graph, but here I've, I've actually filled in the circles uh, uh, around which, uh, for which the, the, um, the telescope would be able to pick a habitable planet. And th there's, there's something like um, 10 or 20 targets. So if you have a, um, what we call eta sub Earth, a frequency, of, an occurrence of, of about 10%, you pick one or two um, actual planets. So now let's talk a little bit what, about what we could do from the ground. Um, this is a very exciting time because there are no three projects uh, in various stages of, of design and construction uh, for of, of very large ground-based telescope, 25 to 40 meter diameter. And they're called extremely large telescopes. So here's a picture. Uh, it's, it's not an actual picture yet. It's a, it's a rendering of one of them, the, the giant Magellan telescope. Um, what we would like to do with these telescopes is take spectra in the near infrared of, of habitable planets. Uh, this would allow us to detect uh, molecular species, um, oxygen, water, uh, uh, methane, uh, carbon dioxide. We could uh, do time variable photometry and polarimetry. This would get us to actually understand uh, what is the atmosphere pattern. Uh, are we seeing atmosphere uh, or ground? Are there clouds that are uh, seasons? Uh, so um, the, the near infrared is actually pretty rich in information if, if we can get this spectra. And, and the interesting thing, if we look at, again, at the same graph, and, 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 and we look at what ground-based telescopes can do, um, the ELTs, the, the, with their very large diameter, give us very good angular resolution. So we can move towards the left in that graph, where we make things easier um, um, if we move to the left, because the contrast becomes uh, less challenging. And at some point, we actually reach the sort of 10 to minus 7 uh, contrast that is achievable from the ground. Uh, from the, with ground-based telescopes, even with telescopes that large, we will not be able to see an Earth twin around a sun-like star because the contrast at about 1 or 10 billion to 1 is, is just too much for the atmosphere. Uh, the atmo we cannot remove the atmosphere to a level that allows us to, to dig that deep. However, if we manage to um, look very close in to the star itself, we can pick different targets, um, fainter stars for which the habitable zone is much closer in but for which the contrast is not nearly as challenging. And this is a regime that is not accessible with current 8 to 10 meter uh, class telescope because they don't have the angular resolution to move sufficiently to the left in that graph to, to even touch this uh, population of, of, of habitable planets. Um, so I'll briefly describe a little bit in more detail what those targets uh, are. Um, here I show in this table some uh, assumptions that went into uh, assessing how, how many stars would be suitable for, for, for this with an with a extremely large telescope. So there are cutoffs on angular separation. The angular separation needs to be larger than the diffraction limit of the telescope. The contrast, uh, the star brightness, so that the adaptive optics system can work. Uh, and also the planet brightness itself. The planet can get pretty faint in some cases. And when we observe from the ground, in the infrared, we always have a, a background, and, and a, that gives us a, a sensitivity limit. So if we plug in this number, and we optimistically assume a boundary for what we call a habitable planet as a planet that's about twice the diameter of the Earth, we find that there are 274 targets, stars in the sky, around which uh, there could exist a habitable planet that we could see. For, for most of them, the planet would need to be bigger than the Earth, and in the uh, and the detection would be pretty challenging. But uh, as you can see in this graph where distance is on the horizontal axis and the planet uh, brightness is on the vertical axis, uh, for the closest one of them, things are considerably easier. So there is, there is a, uh, a non-negligible sample of, of targets which are not uh, too challenging for these telescopes. And if we look at what those targets are in, 
in a diagram which encodes uh, on, the ver on the horizontal axis the, the, the brightness of the star and in the vertical axis its color. We can recognize the main sequence uh, of, of stars and we can see that they're clustered along that main sequence at about um, a, a sort of early to mid M type. So they're, they're smaller than the sun but they're not the smallest uh, uh, stars. Uh, there is two outliers. If I use the pointer I can show you. Them here, they're, they're well below, and uh, there are two white dwarfs, 40 Ari B and Sirius B. So it, it so happens that if those stars had a habitable planet, they would be good targets for the next generation of large telescopes. This is the, the target list, the top 10. Uh, and the first one, on the, they all have uh, names. The first one is Proxima Centauri. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a bit surprising because we don't think as Proxima Centauri as a, as a, as a very good target, uh, usually. And this is mostly because the separation, the habitable separation for Proxima Centauri is just above 20 milliarc seconds. So it's very close. Uh, and we don't have any telescope that can probe that close right now. Um, but if we did, and we will with, with extremely large telescopes, this is a great target. The, um, the contrast is actually close to a million to one, which with, what, uh, with the current extreme adaptive optics technique is within reach. Um, so this, this is very exciting for the, for the near future. This is what Proxima Centauri looks like in the sky. It's in the middle. It's a very faint red star. It's not visible to the naked eye, even though it's the closest star to us. Uh, and if we put it side by side, as shown in the bottom left here, uh, to, the, to the sun, we can see that it's actually much smaller. Uh, it's, 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 um, it's a fraction of the diameter of the sun and also much fainter. Uh, so if, if, if we look actually at the, at the top targets, uh, the contrast we need to reach ranges from 10 to minus 6 to 10 to minus 7. The, the, the dot in the top here is Proxima Centauri, and then there's a few more dots uh, as we get closer to 10 to minus 7 contrast, 10 billion to 1 contrast, which is the contrast level at which the current generation of extreme AO systems in development for 8 to 10 meter class telescope is uh, supposed to operate at. So it's, it's not out of reach. It's, um, in terms of what we could do uh, with, with, with these targets, uh, uh, there is here I, I, I basically I show numbers uh, of, of signal to noise ratio what, what type of data quality we could get for a typical target assuming we have a 30 meter telescope um, and we're looking at an M type star at 5 parsec from us uh, what we find is that um, the signal to noise ratio in, in imaging mode um, uh, if, we ha if we have 10 to the 5 row contrast that means if, which is which is um, uh, right around where, where we hope to be in terms of how faint we make the image at the location of a planet uh, is, is about uh, uh, 16 uh, in, in just an hour. And we could actually do spectroscopy on, on, on this target um, at, at a resolution of, of up to 100 if we, um, if, uh, if, if we take these numbers into account. So there's one challenge that I haven't talked about is, is the, if you remember, my, m in the first part of the presentation, I, I talked about how to make the edge of the uh, beam uh, fuzzy, uh, not sharp, so we don't have diffraction. If you look at all of the large 30 meter class telescopes that are the, the three projects that are currently in, in design and construction, none of them has a nice single large mirror. They're all segments. Uh, some of them have a lot of small segments. Others have fewer larger segments, but they're not the nice round uh, single uh, beam. So we, we had to work a little bit on modifying our, our, our chronograph design so that we could work with, with such segments. And here um, uh, you can see what it involves. It involves doing this apodization without losing light. So this, this beam shaping, that's the left. The light travels from the left to the right. That's the left part of this chart. But we have to add a few masks uh, that, that, that process the beam a little further. And when we get to the end of it, we actually manage to remove all the light from a central uh, star uh, uh, f for this aperture. And we've learned how to design these coronagraphs for arbitrary uh, aperture shapes. So here you can take the three uh, uh, pupil shapes for the, for the three projects of extremely large telescope. And for every single one of them, we can design the coronagraph so that if there is no wavefront error, we would actually remove uh, all of the light from a, uh, on an axis point. Uh, this is the for 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 the Subaru telescope, which is a, a, in the top left, uh, which is a, an eight meter 
uh, a representative 8 meter telescope, current generation of telescope, and for the three uh, extremely large telescopes, GMT, TMT, and European ELT, this is what the transmission would be as a function of angular separation. So in each case, what you can see is that uh, the transmission is exactly zero on axis, which is good. That means we remove the light from the on axis uh, target perfectly. This assumes no wavefront error, so we have to take care of that as well. And that's what extreme adaptive optics uh, uh, is going to do. And then as we move out, if we, if we place a planet and we gradually move it out of the star, we find that at about one lambda verde, at one diffraction element from the optical axis, we're above 50% throughput. And then when we're at uh, two lambda verde, two diffraction limits, we're at essentially close to 100% throughput. So if you remember Proxima Centauri was a little more than 20 million arcs second. For the 30 meter class telescopes, uh, that's two diffraction limits uh, in the near infrared. So we're basically, uh, we have designs that, that allow us to, to have close to 100% transmission for in the coronagraph at that separation. Um, so this is not just uh, uh, ideas on paper. We're actually already doing this kind of work on eight meter class telescope. Unfortunately, as I talked about, the telescope is not large enough so that we can see Earths uh, with them, but we can, we can see Jupiter type planets and we can test the technology so that in a few years, uh, with high confidence, we can say, okay, it's working to the level of performance on an 8 to 10 meter class telescope, such that if we moved it to a 30 meter telescope, we would have access to this habitable planet. Uh, so this is the, the project that I lead at the Subaru Telescope. Uh, you can see that the, um, there are, our, our instrument has two optical benches, and, and in the green insert, you can see what the lower optical bench looks like. There's a lot of things in there. Most of them are not the chronograph itself. The, this reshaping of the optics is actually quite easy. It's just static optics, and you just put them in the beam, and, and it will do it. It's, it's, I'm not saying it's particularly easy to design, but once you've designed it and made it, it works, and doesn't take much room. Essentially, all of what you see here is all the things you need to do to do wavefront control, to keep the atmosphere from uh, erasing your signal. Uh, and that's, that's a lot more difficult than the chronograph uh, itself. And so this, I, I don't have time to talk in much detail about that, but the two have to go together. For a ground-based system, you need to have a very good chronograph and you need to have a very good uh, adaptive optic system. And also on top of that, a very good calibration of what is left in the image, even after you do adaptive optics, so that you can pull out a planet out of your signal. Um, so to summarize the science opportunities, if we look again at this sequence of stars the, um, from the top left, which are faint stars, to the bottom right, which are uh, bright stars, there is a, a very nice complementarity between what we will be able to do from the ground and from space. From space, where we can't realistically afford in the next few years to launch a 30 meter telescope, we're constrained by angular resolution. We can't access the leftmost part of this graph but we can go pretty deep in contrast because there's no atmosphere. Uh, and so the best targets will be uh, right near, near the center, sun-like stars, uh, around which we can look for Earth-like planets with a telescope. Uh, and the entry uh, diameter for this is about two to four meter diameter. And in the ground, the extremely large telescopes in the near infrared will allow us to probe habitable planets around much fainter stars uh, at much uh, closer angular separation, but at reduced contrast. So um, I'll, I'll finish by talking about something completely different. I, I probably, you know, if, if, if you just, if I stop my presentation right now, you'd think, oh, the detecting planet is just so hard. Uh, it's going to take millions of dollars and hundreds of people working for years, uh, even though we're making good progress. Um, and, and what I want, the, the message I want to, uh, to carry in the very last part of this talk is that, there's, that that's not true if, if we're uh, thinking about transit uh, detection. And so I've been working with a few people over the last few years, and this is no ramping up, on a project that is aimed at engaging uh, citizen scientists and uh, uh, schools into discovering exoplanets and actually building the hardware to discover exoplanets. The technique, uh, we use this is the same technique that's been very successful with, uh, with ground-based survey and also especially with Kepler, is the transit technique. We just uh, wait and uh, wait and, and wait for a planet to move in front of a star and, and dim its light as, as we see it from Earth. This is a picture we took of, of, uh, of the Venus transit uh, uh, last year in June. Um, so what we want to see is the same thing around other stars. 
we're not going to take pictures of that, like that, but what we're going to see is, is the, the star uh, flux will dim a little bit. And so this, this project is aimed at making it as, as easy as possible for, uh, for anyone to actually participate into this right from the hardware level, building something that uh, with a good sense of ownership uh, and, and, and making it look at the sky and discover an uh, exoplanet. And so the project is Panoptes. Uh, there's a, a fancy acronym for it. You can look at uh, our website uh, and you can email us if, if you want uh, more information. The two challenges that, that, that we have to overcome is our, our, our basic, the, uh, technical and, and cost related. So we need to actually find a way that um, uh, without spending a, a, a large amount of, of money and without requiring exotic professional level hardware, people can actually build something to discover exoplanets. Um, and, and, and the aim of the project is to facilitate this and to coordinate uh, at, at, at the international level uh, an effort where people would take images, put them together, and, and discover exoplanets uh, from them. Um, and what we're using is digital cameras. We're not using CCD cameras, even though they're better, they're more expensive and, and less um, accessible to people. We're, uh, we're, we're, act we're actually planning to use digital cameras that you can buy uh, for, for a few hundred dollars uh, to, to, to take images of the sky to discover exoplanets using the transit technique. And those cameras are a very good value for the money uh, because they're mass produced. They're engineered to be extremely robust. Um, and their performance are, are quite acceptable. Um, and so we've spent the last couple of years demonstrating we could do this with, with such cameras. Um, and this is a prototype that we built uh, on, on the Mauna Loa Observatory. This is the version number two of our prototype. And this is a sample image. This is uh, an image, I think, uh, a couple of minute exposure. There's, there's more than 100,000 stars in, in an image. This is another example of an image in a slightly less crowded area. And if I zoom the bottom right corner, the bottom left corner, this is what it looks like. So it's uh, very inexpensive hardware gets you a lot of stars and pretty images. But that's, that's not the whole story because we need to know do photometry with this, uh, high precision photometry. Uh, this is a, a, a more recent version of, of our latest uh, prototype, which now has four cameras in the same mount. So it's, there's a laptop, uh, an, an, uh, a low cost uh, uh, commercial equatorial mount, and there's four cameras mounted on, on this, four digital cameras. This is the type of images you get if you zoom up to a star. You can see that our main problem, our main challenge, the, the one challenge we have to overcome for precision photometry, is the interaction between the star, PSF, and the pixels, which are color sensitive. So some of the pixels are sensitive only to red light, some only to green light, some only to blue light. As the, the PSF moves across those pixels, and if you just counted how much light there is, uh, by summing the values, you would get huge variations from the interaction between the PSF and the pixels. And so we developed an algorithm that moves us from um, about 10, 10 to 20% photometric error on a one minute cadence, which is shown in the left, which is what you get if you sum up the pixel, to the result on the right, which is um, at, at the uh, percent level uh, uh, systematic error in a one minute cadence. Um, and then when you sum up uh, redot noise, uh, especially photon noise and, um, and scintillation were at uh, basically one and a half percent for every minute for each camera. Um, and this is good enough to detect transits. With a single camera, we've detected, uh, uh, we've confirmed a few very well known transits, the deep ones that are between one and three percent deep, using a single digital camera. So now the, game, the, the name of the game is to have multiple cameras uh, combine their signal to increase the sensitivity and the, and the discovery space. Um, and you can check the website. The, the, what we're very actively doing right now is uh, polish what we call our baseline. This is a step-by-step -step instruction where you can uh, buy inexpensive hardware, put it together, download the software to actually build this and, and operate it. And we're uh, uh, partnering with amateur astronomers and a few schools to, to, uh, to start this project and, and hopefully expand it uh, where, where it becomes, where, where um, a lot of the uh, benefit comes from combining uh, m multiple cameras and, and powering citizen scientists and, and, and especially students into uh, all aspects of, of um, transit exoplanet discovery right from the har building the hardware all the way to software and, and science. Thank you.
Well, we have a few questions. I'll, I'll just ask the first one, Olivier. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the total cost of a, one of these installations is around $2,000, is it? Um, so if you, if you just put one, one camera, it's about $3,000. Okay. And is most of the cost in the camera? Uh, um, the, the camera is about five to $600. Okay. The, the lens, depends which lens you pick. The one, the one we're uh, uh, putting for a baseline is about $400. The mount is about $1,500. The laptop is a few hundred dollars. And then there's a few <coughs> small cost items that you have to add to that. And you get to about $3,000. It's three thousand dollars, but you get an expensive camera as well as part of the package. So that's <laughs> you know, that's fantastic. Thanks. Uh, uh, so assuming that the recession is over and you have all the money that you want, uh, could you uh, con uh, conceivably uh, improve the resolution by building multiple such telescopes uh, uh, and uh, spreading spreading them out over the Pacific Ocean on various islands and maybe building an optical interferometer? Uh, would uh, that uh, also coronagraph? Would that work as well? Uh, I, I like the, I question, like the way you think. Yeah. No <laughs> constraint in, in money. I have one more question. Yeah, thanks. Um, we, so if, 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 if we're trying to detect habitable planets, uh, um, 30 meter telescope is, is already large enough to give us the angular resolution. So we don't, we don't require uh, an interferometer. We, on, if we think about longer term, even more exciting goal, however, where interferometry becomes essential is if we want to think about taking resolved image of those planets, where yes. we want to okay. take an image of the planet and see several pixels, continents, hopefully right. cities. Um, <laughs> that's that's a long time in the future, but if, 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 if you tell me that I don't need to think about time and money, <laughs> uh, that's that's extremely exciting, and, and it will require interferometry, well, probably in space. Well, actually, uh, uh, maybe an easier target might be to uh, image uh, uh, if you, if you if you're trying to image a uh, uh, a very large star, say Betelgeuse, for example, yes. uh, you with this kind of system, you could actually even image different zones of a uh, of a large red giant star, for example. That's right. That would and, be fun. And, and interferometers are, are already have already been doing that. Uh, uh, current interferometers, and so yes, your point is is, is very valid, and you, you can do that with interferometers very well. So it's a little different from from. The science goal of, of looking for planets, but it's, it's also. I have a question about the engineering of your coronagraph, <clears throat> and so to get these ten to the what seventh, ten to the ninth contrast ratios, uh, that gets to the question of the surface figure of these mirrors, what their scattering or BRDF is, especially at these very close things. What sort of surface roughnesses and materials are you talking about? Do you need to actually get rid of the haze from the surface to not swamp out this diffractive effect. So for all of those systems, we, we, we're, we're stuck in the regime where there is essentially no way we can make a large mirror good enough that it would work. So we have to pair it with a wavefront correction system uh, using a, one or several uh, deformable mirrors. And once we do that, uh, we find out that uh, the scattering of the mirror is not such a big deal because it will scatter light quite far away from where we're looking uh, for the planet. So if you think about where, if you look at an image where light is scattered and you trace back where it comes from, if it's very far away from the optical axis, much further away than we're looking for the planet, it corresponds to very high spatial frequencies on the mirror, which is what uh, r surface roughness gives you. What we care about is really how much light there is right next to the star, which corresponds to low order aberrations. So there are things, they are basically the general shape of the, of the mirror, not its roughness. And that's what we need to have very good. And the way we achieve that is a combination, is, is by using a deformable mirror and iteratively driving it to cancel whatever residual light uh, we see. So actually, when I showed this, um, I didn't have time to explain this, but all of us who are doing uh, high contrast imaging, we, we use essentially the same technique. We're working with images like this, and we're looking at this area where we want to make things dark, and we see light. And that light comes from optical aberrations. And, and the first thing is we say, oh, this is bad. What are we going to do? But then, then there's one thing we know very well how to do is to make things worse in a way that we know. 
So we drive the deformed mirror to make things worse. We add light in that dark hole, and we watch how it interferes with the light that was already there. That gives us enough information to actually know how to turn it around and make a destructive interference, how to remove that aberration. And we iterate that process until um, it settles down. And if there's no planet, it'll settle down to a very dark area, like in this image. And if there's a planet, we can't remove it, because we can't take light from the star, combine it with light from the planet, and have them interfere. They're not coherent. Olivier, uh, I have a question about the PanOps project. It's very interesting uh, if this get imagine widespread and you can get, for example, 10,000 cameras around the world doing this. Can you assume that the errors are not correlated and then the, the precision on the light curve is going to go down at the square root of the number of cameras that you are? That's, that's a very good question. And, and there's multiple levels. There's depends on what error you're talking about. And there's multiple levels at which things will decorate. The first thing that will happen, um, so you get, you, get, you get a decorrelation up to um, maybe a, a hundred frames, a hundred images with the same camera. Uh, but past that, you start to have correlation. So you don't, you don't win by, by averaging, uh, by, by exposing longer, for example, on a single transit with one camera. And then you can have multiple cameras, so the, the PSF falls on different pixels. But, um, but then if they're mounted on the same mount, you have a correlation that comes from tracking errors. So this is actually what we're exploring right now with the four camera system, is what's the sweet spot for how many cameras we put on the same mount. After that, you want to, um, so once you know that number, which is probably around two or three cameras, you want to avoid putting more than two or three cameras on the same mount. So you want to build separate mount. And then, then there's another correlation that comes after that, which is the weather, the atmosphere. Uh, scintillation decorrelates very quickly as you move those cameras to different mount. But uh, the, the transmission map of the sky and its time variation does not correlate, decorrelate as quickly. So then at some point, when you build maybe five to 10 units at the same location, your best thing is to build the next unit far away from it. Um, and then once, but you can have 100 units at the same location, and they could be looking at different parts of the sky. And then you, you don't have that, that correlation issue. So, so this is something when you, when you build a network and optimize which camera is looking where, that's something to keep in mind. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so until you have your uh, infinite budget at the end of the recession and have a bunch of 30-meter yes. telescopes and a bunch of flying telescopes in, in orbit, uh, is there any science to be done from putting a medium-sized telescope on a 747 and going up eight or nine miles and, and trying this technique? Um, possibly. Yes. So I, this is... This is an, uh, an interesting uh, idea, and, and I'm not sure I can answer it because um, um, on, on it, it really depends on how stable you can make that environment. And, and I, I'm actually not a specialist of, of, of what happens when you do that in terms of wavefront quality. You, you'll have some level of vibration. Uh, the partial atmospheric pressure helps you, but it's pretty disturbed right around the Earth crack, probably. So at, at, I. I I think this is something that should be explored. I don't know the answer yet. Um, and, and, but I think your point is, is, is very interesting because if, if we find out that this is actually a sensible way to do things and, and, and we could get pretty deep in contrast, um, it's, it's a very nice uh, thing we could do on the short term uh, at, at a smaller cost than, than launching a, a space telescope. Yeah. <coughs> hey, Olivier, um, thank you for this talk. Um, so you, we mentioned we are talking about budget limitation and so on. So my my question is related. Uh, NASA was gifted by two telescopes a few months ago, and these telescopes are two two meter in size. Two point four meter. Two point four meters, and you show a graph saying that uh, we should build an instrument with a two meter glass telescope to detect these uh, exoplanets uh, around yes. G-type star. So my question is very direct. Did you have a proposal for this telescope? Did you submit something? And do you know it has been selected? We are actively working on this. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and the exercise is, is finding the right balance between how greedy we want to be with the science, with how technology mature uh, the technologies that we need are. For, for this specific mission, uh, the primary goal of the mission is infrared, wide field infrared survey. So it's the, the first of these two telescopes we used uh, for a mission which is called W-First. The chronograph 
is a, an additional instrument, not the primary instrument, which means that the chronograph does not have all the freedom to drive the schedule and needs to be um, uh, at, at the, the cost and, 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 and technology maturity are, are somewhat constrained. So it's, it's depending on who you talk, you get different answers as to where we should aim. You can guess where I stand. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, it's a, a lot of us are thinking very hard about this right now. And it's, um, it's both exciting and, and a little uncertain because this is, we're, we're, this is going potentially to be the very first time we actually have an optimized chronograph in space. So there's a lot of questions. We have no experience as to um, uh, how to do this in space and, and, and how stable are things in space how deep we can go in contrast. Uh, so there's a lot of study right now that, that's happening to try to figure this out. For, for a lot of us, the, the, the big question is exactly the one you can, you, you're asking. Is it, is it going to be possible to actually start eating into this uh, population of, of potentially habitable planet? And, and the jury is still out. <laughs> I'd like to ask a question about the ground-based telescopes. Uh, you gave us a nice idea of the fact that the uh, 30 meter telescopes and others. The 30 meter telescope has been signed off. I guess work's supposed to start next year. But my question has to do with, uh, with dust. Most planetary systems have dust, the zodiacal light, and so on. To what extent does that zodiacal light and the dust uh, impact what you expect to find uh, with these systems? So it, 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 the dust will come at two levels. It, it comes as, as a source of information as to the architecture of the planetary system. Uh, because planets carve gaps in dust and, and they interact with dust and it comes as a source of noise uh, where we don't, we don't want to be confused between dust and, and, and the planet. It actually helps to have a very uh, a large telescope with a small, uh, with a good angular resolution and looking at the most nearby system so that the dust, which is a surface brightness uh, issue, gets well separated from the point source, uh, which is the planet. Um, and and, and um, f for the the, the, pro the dust problem is, is, is a lot less challenging for the ground-based telescope than it will be for the space-based telescope, which are looking at, the, at systems uh, with, with less angular resolution. So they'll, they'll actually have, uh, um, they'll be more sensitive to dust than inhomogeneities in dust. Um, a, a big question, which is still unanswered, is what is statistically the, um, the, the, the brightness level and homogeneity of dust disks around the around nearby stars. There's very little data on this. Um, we're very eager to find out about this. There are, uh, NASA is, uh, is funding the uh, L LBT interferometers to, to try to help us answer that question. And, and that's, that's, um, that's something we're following very carefully because there's a risk that, that dust will be a, a significant uh, challenge. And, and if it is, then we have to, uh, we can mitigate it uh, in the instrument design by including polarimetry, multispectral imaging, and observing the system for longer period of time to try to characterize its, its dynamics. But this is very, um, this is still an outstanding issue, and we don't understand yet how much of a problem uh, this is. All right. Um, with that, Olivia, we have a, um, a special uh, black mug. Uh, potentially uh, could be used as a coronagraph uh, in your office. <laughs> yes, yes. It's got the right color. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> please, please join me in thanking Olivier for his great talk.